All right, we've learned a lot about neurophysiology, and this is a physiology class, so that makes sense. I'm going to speak just a little bit about parts of the brain, just a little bit, and it's because I have an ulterior motive, right? There actually is very little on your exam two uh, concerning the material inside of this video. Um, so the brain has got four main parts, the cerebrum, that's all of this wrinkly part, and that's what we do, what's considered thinking. All of the conscious stuff that's available to us, knowing that the smell we're smelling is the smell of chocolate chip cookies, deciding to go get chocolate chip cookies, um, even our likes and dislikes for chocolate chip cookies, although who would dislike a chocolate chip cookie? Um, that is all done in the, the cerebrum. As a matter of fact, humans, when we think of the brain, we usually are thinking of the cerebrum. Then we've got the diencephalon. The diencephalon has got unconscious um, and autonomic functions. But what do I mean by unconscious? Unconscious, I'm actually describing a lot the way the hypothalamus takes conscious information, like it's cold or I'm scared or my boss is a drag, conscious information and translates it in a way that we are not um, able to consciously um, modulate like higher or lower levels of hormone in the body. So that's unconscious. Then we've got the brainstem and the brainstem, you know, is the midbrain, the pons and the medulla oblongata. And these guys, oh, diencephalon, midbrain, pons and medulla oblongata. And these guys do what we consider autonomic, controlling our blood pressure, controlling our heart rate. Um, and the brainstem can act even in the absence of the cerebrum. Uh, what the hypothalamus does, it cannot as efficiently do all of those functions in the absence of the cerebrum, but the brainstem's fine without, without a cerebrum around. And then we've got the cerebellum, and the cerebellum is our refinement of motion. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. I know that I very often think that the reason that I can take my finger fingertip way out there and I can touch my nose and I don't punch myself or poke myself in the eye, uh, the reason that I can do that, I think that is attributable to my brain, uh, to that uh, pre-central gyrus of the frontal lobe of the brain. But, but that actually is not completely true. It's true that that pre-central gyrus of the frontal lobe of the brain is what is issuing the command, please touch your nose. But the truth is, as I am moving my fingertip to gently touch my nose, at every step along the way, my uh, all kinds of sensory receptors in my joints and in my muscles and in my tendons and in my connective tissue, they're all telling my brain, particularly my cerebellum, where I am on that journey. Am I moving too fast? Am I moving too slow? Am I too high? Am I too low? It is telling my cerebellum all of that. My cerebellum in return is refining what I can do so that I end up just going bink without like punching myself. So let me show you a video of a cat that has a problem with the cerebellum. Now, I don't think in my videos, I don't think you'll be able to hear what is going on, but that's okay. Uh, this is little Gordon here, and little Gordon, can I make you go? Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start it. This is a kitten, and this kitten has got a problem called cerebellar hype. Oh, well, that's not right. Let's try again. Um, let's go back. Let's go forward. I had it all set up. This is a kitten with a, a poorly developed cerebellum. And you can see that he's very uncoordinated. Now, we don't have any of his litter mates near him. So it's you're like, oh, he's just a bumbling kitten. No, this is something more. Uh, he's having a lot of difficulty learning to walk. And he keeps falling down. And the reason is that his cerebellum, his his Pre-central gyrus is good at giving commands, take us all, take a step, 
But the cerebellum, oh, here's him when he grows up. And you can see that he's grown up very nicely. He doesn't fall down a lot anymore. Um, if you were to watch him play, you would notice that his balance is not perfect, um, but he's a very happy cat. And by the way, for those of you who are interested in cats, um, cats with cerebellar hypoplasia um, actually make lovely pets because they're very, very, very affectionate, right? So the cerebrum does thinking, interpreting impulses, initiating voluntary, initiating voluntary movements like I will take a step, I will chase the cat toy. Um, this is where we store our memories. This is where our, our what we would consider our, our intelligence and our personality primarily resides. This is where we make decisions. So that's our cerebrum. Now, I wanted to point out here that this central uh, sulcus is the dividing line between the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. And this post-central gyrus is where all of our experience of cutaneous sensation takes place. So if you're being touched on the hand or the knee, this is the area uh, that is um, receiving that information. This pre-central gyrus is where we will initiate all of our action, even our actions of speech, um, all of our voluntary movements are initiated right here. Now, I'd like you to appreciate what a very small part of the brain this motor region is, right? All of this area of the frontal lobe where our personality would reside and where our creativity may reside, all of that is much larger. Uh, our parietal lobe and our temporal lobe and our occipital lobes are even much larger. And yet, when, when we as human beings are evaluating human beings, we often, most often, will rely on the way that human being is able to move, right? So if a human being is able to move properly, we notice. If a human being is not able to move properly, we also notice. And for some of us that have got really good perception of these things, we may uh, be really good poker players. We may just instinctively notice that, that there's a certain tenseness around someone's eyes when they've got a good hand and it's not there when they have a bad hand at poker. We make you a really good poker player, being to able to read other people. Now, I wanted to show you, oh, I told you about uh, the cerebellum. I wanted to show you um, a video of someone who has got an abnormality of their motor regions of the brain. Uh, this guy is Josh Blue. Josh Blue is a stand-up comic. And Josh Blue uh, has got um, cerebral palsy. He has cerebral palsy. Now, when people have got cerebral palsy, I, I don't think you'll be able to hear him. Okay, so uh, whether you were able to hear him or not hear him, already, even without hearing him, you have made assumptions about this individual. You know, it's, it's not a bad thing that humans can do this. It's probably the reasons why, one of the reasons why humans have been able to take over the planet is because we can read each other so quickly. Uh, but what I wanted to point out to you is that even though this particular individual cannot move properly because there is damage to the part of his brain that initiates and maintains motions, not the cerebellum, part of the cerebrum in this person's case, even though that is true, that has absolutely nothing to do with his creativity or his, or his intellect or his memory or his imagination, or his mathematical skills, or his ability to master physics. It has nothing to do with any of that. And you might say to yourself, oh, sure, sure, I know that. I know that. Do you? Because I'll tell you, 
that particularly those of you who are going to be going into the field of medicine, you, you will come across people, actually we all do every day, people that do have problems with motion. Maybe they had a stroke. Maybe they've got a problem uh, from birth the way this guy did. Maybe they had a damaged because of a car accident, right? But for whatever reason, they're not able to move properly. And when they're unable to move properly or even speak properly, we will make assumptions about their intellect. And I just want to make a point that there's no way to really know the intellect of an individual from the way that they are moving. And those of you who are going to be in the healthcare uh, industry, I want you to remember this, that when you have got a person in front of you that clearly needed to be brought to the hospital or to the um, doctor's office by a caregiver because they're not able to move well, not able to walk, maybe they're sitting in a wheelchair, slumped to one side, drooling a little bit. No matter what, if they are your patient, you should direct your questions to the patient. You should look them in the face, maybe not in the eye, but directly in the face, and you can say, how can I help you? Why are you here today, right? Now, it is very possible that the caregiver that brought them there is going to tell you, oh, I'm sorry, he doesn't speak. You know what? They will still be grateful that you did not make that assumption, right? And if you are a person who's in a wheelchair or a person like this guy, Josh Blue, this is actually, he was on the Tonight Show when he was doing this particular thing. So, um, he was even on The Tonight Show and he's got a heck of a uh, professional career, right? Clearly nothing wrong with his intellect or anything. And yet still, if he goes into a restaurant with his wife, who is uh, does not have obvious disability, uh, the waiter will always ask his wife, what would he like to eat, okay? So yes, it's true. You might speak to the guy in the wheelchair and their caregiver may say, I'm sorry, he can't speak. Make that mistake. Don't be, make the mistake of speaking past someone who is cognitively able, brain works fine, they're just physically disabled. And by the way, you're gonna laugh, but even when people are blind, even when people are blind, waiters and, and people that are in the service industry will sometimes ask the normal sighted person, what would he like to eat? And he's just blind. It's not like he can't decide what he wants to eat by himself, okay? The diencephalon we talked about, that's going to be the thalamus and the hypothalamus. We know the hypothalamus is super important for all of the endocrine action, right? Uh, blood pressure, oh, urine output, partly because of antidiuretic hormone, also endocrine, okay? And then we have got the brainstem, which controls respiratory rate, and it's the most uh, ancient part of our brain. By the way, there are times when patients are brain dead, and there, there is much more we need to know about being brain dead, okay? Being in a persistent coma is not the same as being brain dead, but... When people are brain dead, sometimes they have absolutely no cerebrum left. So, so there is no chance that that person will come back to their family. And yet, not only will they be able to have a normal heart rate and normal respiratory rate, but they also will have um, different reflexes. Like if you pinch their finger, they will pull their hand away. Like if there's a loud sound, their eyes will be directed to the loud sound. And the reason that can happen is because of the brain stem. And it is part of the heartbreaking nature of patients that are brain dead, that they give all of the appearances of, of possibly coming back to the person.
All right, which brain lobes are responsible for the refinement of conscious motion? Pause me because I'm about to tell you. Yeah, it's the cerebellum. That was little Gordon, the cat. All righty, I won't be talking about aphasia because it's not on the exam, but it's fascinating. And we are, I will see you when you start preparing for exam three.